Hello, hello, Player One Taco coming to you live from LA at the LA Blockchain Summit. We are at the Draper Gorn Home uh, event uh, and we are here with Austin. Austin, where are you from? Uh, I'm from Kansas City. Okay, cool. What project are you from? Uh, uh, so I work on Rivet, okay. which is uh, Blockchain Infrastructure Gateway. So uh, if you need information from the blockchain, yeah. you can either run your own node which is awesome, but it's also hard. Mm -hmm. um, you can buy the information that you need from us. Or we, we also have a great free tier for people who are just getting started. Uh, or you can pay more to get that information from one of our competitors. Okay. Uh, so when did we first meet? Uh, I believe it was at East Denver 2022. Okay. So, uh, so East Denver this year? Yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's possible we've crossed paths before that. We've both been on the conference circuit. So Yeah. Um, no, it was, it was amazing. But that, that, that's when I remember meeting you. <laughs> yeah, no, um, it was sort of amazing walking here on day one, and you're like, I know you. We met at the bottom of the stairs, and we had a great time, and we uh, met at the bottom of the stage left, and you're and you're like, right there at the ramp. And I was like, oh, yeah. Yep. So, um, East Denver, what did you guys do at East Denver? Um, so, so, East Denver this year was a... For, for us, it was all about making connections. Uh, you know, we build blockchain infrastructure, so we were looking for uh, you know applications that need that infrastructure. But more than anything, we're looking for chains that need infrastructure. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of uh, underserved layer twos and, and smaller layer ones out there that uh, you know, can't bring, bring bridges on board, can't bring uh, oracles on board, or, or NFT marketplaces, things like that. That uh, you know, the, the technology is ready to work with them, but they don't have the reliable infrastructure that some of those projects would rely on to, to come build for them. So we, we were there mostly trying to to meet projects that need our services to... Okay. Uh, now, now, in the past, uh, th that was... How many East Denver's? 18, 19, 20, 22? Because uh, there wasn't one in 21. No. Uh, or 20. But, no, right. No, it was it, it was in twenty, yeah. just as the shit was starting. Yeah, to yeah, fan. yeah. No, um, so I think that's this badge. Oh yeah, so you, you were there. <laughs> you probably did cross paths. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I was there uh, at the very first East Denver. I was on the key split team. We won one of the won one of the grand prizes at the first East Denver, uh, and then. In 19, we built a project called Crypto Cattle, which was a, uh, a game to kind of lead into conversations about our other project called Ether Cattle, which eventually grew into becoming Rivet. Okay. Uh, and then in 2020, for the East Denver Blockchain uh, Hackathon, we uh, built Flume, which is a core part of our infrastructure today. Yeah. So, so um, Let's let's break a lot of that down because sure. yes, this is a, a industry talk and stuff like that. Um, but a lot of people, when they say infrastructure, they don't necessarily know what that does to support. Well, and, and it, what I mean, it actually it, it, means. It, it means different things to different people. Exactly. Too, right? So, uh, it, you know, one of my partners yesterday was on a uh, panel that was about blockchain infrastructure, and we were the only company there that that you know, provides APIs that people connect to to. Uh, get the info. You know, there, there was a company that builds mining equipment. Mm -hmm. That's infrastructure. Yep. Uh, you know, there was a company that builds. Uh, you know, uh, has systems for uh, liquidity. Yep. You know, and for for a lot of these marketplaces, that's infrastructure that they build on top of. Um, you know, for, for us, when we talk about being an, a blockchain infrastructure company, uh, we are running the nodes and building the APIs that people need in order to build applications. Yep. Um, we have redesigned node infrastructure from the ground up. Okay. You know, blockchain nodes are designed to be participants in a peer-to-peer -peer network. Mm -hmm. And they get information from random people on the internet. They have to download that, do uh, cryptographic verifications, which is computationally intensive. Yep. And then they have to store that data in a way that allows them to do f further cryptographic verifications of 
information they get in the future. None of that is conducive to serving applications with the information that they need. Yeah. Right. So if you're, you know, running a wallet, and you just want to check what is my token balance. Okay. Uh, that will go out to a, a node, and a traditional Ethereum node will navigate this thing called a state tree mm-hmm. that involves reading the disk 76 times. It's a little bit of an exaggeration, but not much. Uh, in, in order to, to verify, to, to, to yeah, to do this cryptographic verification of this is the balance, and then it throws away the cryptographic verification, and just gives you the balance. Yeah, right. Um, you, you don't actually need that need it to do that verification when all you're going to do is display this balance uh, on the home page. So uh, what we did was we we took. We still run the peer-to-peer nodes because we've got to get the information somehow. Yep. But then we take that that data and we feed it down into a couple of different types of replicas that are good at organizing the data, not for participating in a peer-to-peer network, but serving that data to applications. Okay. So they can serve that data faster. The nodes that we operate are lightweight uh, and, and cheap, break cheaper that, to operate. Break, break that down because a lot of people hear the word okay, light and so, they so, think that it's so, a framework. Uh, a, a traditional Ethereum node at, at this day and age probably has 500 gigs worth of data. Yep. Our replica nodes have about 100 gigs worth of data and can answer almost all the same questions. There, okay. There's like one question about cryptographic proofs that we have to delegate back to our regular nodes. GPU intensive? Not at all. Okay. We so don't even have GPUs on the nodes. So can people run it on, on their on their home computer? Yeah. So so this is all open source. Okay. Um, now. Uh, to, to, to do this, you've still you've got to have the conventional Ethereum node that you're pulling the information out of into the replicas. So the, the overhead for this is not insignificant, mm-hmm. but it scales very well, okay. right? So, so there's not a whole lot of reason somebody would want to run this on their home computer. Mm-hmm. But if you are an application team, and rather than uh, you, you want to run the node infrastructure for you know, yourself for for trust reasons, for ownership. decentralization reasons, for ownership reasons. Uh, the, the, everything that we build is open source. Okay. Uh, at the top layer, with our uh, to, to, to get the information that we need out of uh, Geth, we have a fork of Geth that we call Plugf, and it is an extensible Geth implementation. Yep. So you can write a plugin in Go. Uh, and, and people use this for all sorts of things. Yeah. It, 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 this Geth is, is the, a fun developer well, piece. Uh, yeah. So, 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 How do you pronounce Gorly? Uh, I've always said Gorly. Oh. Um, okay. I, I, I don't think that's right for, you know, all of the Ethereum test nets are named after uh, train stations in Europe. Yeah. And I don't think I'm pronouncing it the way that the people who go to that train station would pronounce it. Uh, but that, that's, I've always said Gorly. That, so... I feel like I knew the train station thing. I think someone had told me that once, and I completely forgot about it. But that is a good reminder. Yeah, there, there's uh, Rinkby, Rinkby, Robston, Covan, Sapolia, Gorley. Yeah. Uh, and, and my understanding, and I, I, I haven't been to any of those. Okay. But my, my understanding is that they're named after train stations in, in Europe. Nice. And, and I think they're all train stations in one country in Europe, but I can't remember what it is. Okay. Do your own research. Find that out. <laughs> And let me know in the comments. Um, so, all right. So, what was it that the you know now that we're sort of knowing what you're doing, what was the problem that you saw that made you sure. want to be like provide a solution? So, so I'm actually wearing the, the shirt from my original project today. Uh, Cattle? Uh, no, this this is Open Relay. Oh, okay. So, uh, the the first project that we built was called Open Re- the, in the crypto space anyway. It was called Open Relay. And uh, it, it was the first open source order book for the ZeroX protocol. ZeroX being a mm-hmm. exchange protocol. Uh, originally for Ethereum, they branched out to a, a bunch of different EVM-based chains. Um, and we built Open Relay with a uh, microservices architecture. Everything was redundant. Everything was scalable. Okay. Um, you know, at, at one point, j- just as a proof of concept, we filled in an order for every address on the Ethereum blockchain. Had an order that they could come pull out of the Open Relay order book and fill uh, to, to get a token we created called Invigin, which is 
fun thing, its own side story. We, we don't need to go into that right now. Oh, but, we will. Uh, we will. We, we, we can. I, I'm happy to. I, I, how long is this conversation going to go on? However long you want to talk. Fair enough. I can talk forever. Oh, I'm going to tell you the same So, um, anyway, the, the, this, this open relay order book with the microservices architecture that we built was uh, incredibly stable except for one piece. And that was our node infrastructure. Okay. So if we wanted to run our own nodes, um, they were incredibly flaky. You know, if, if they lost peers, they had to be restarted, catch up with the network, it could take hours. Mm -hmm. um, you know, God forbid the, the server crashes and now you have to rebuild your, your node. Yeah. Um, and, and so this, this one part of our stack didn't work like the rest, but it also happened to be the one part of the stack that everybody needs. No matter what you're building on the blockchain, you need reliable node infrastructure. So, why do we need reliable node infrastructure? Because that's how you get information from the blockchain. Like the, the, the node, the node is to the blockchain what the ISP is to the internet. Yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, if your ISP goes down, you're you're not getting any information. If your node goes down, you're not getting any information about the blockchain. Yeah. So uh, then, the question then that people have asked before about decentralization of nodes. If a node goes down, why should it matter? If it's supposed to be decentralized. So to the network, it doesn't matter, right? The, the network will keep chugging along and you continue operating. But to the individual application or individual or application that is getting information from that node, okay. if, they do, if the node that they're getting information from goes down, that application isn't going to be able to continue serving th their users. So, uh, with some of the recent changes um, on the Ethereum network, aka you know the merge, and then getting ready for the splurge, um, which then leads to the verge. I then, thought the splurge came more towards the end. I think. I don't know. Purge comes at the end. Okay. I think it was a lot of lurges involved. There, there are. Yeah, and, 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 urges. Yeah, a lot of a lot, a lot of urges. Yeah. Um, so. With uh, with that, uh, from from POW to uh, POS, um, and I know we're jumping ahead a little bit in the infrastructure piece. How were you guys able to pivot? Were you able to pivot very easily? Uh, it was more of a distraction than I would have liked it to be. Mm -hmm. um, we we had to add support for the Beacon chain, mm -hmm. and uh, I was hoping I'll... Beacon would become like the new name, like Beacon chain instead of like calling it. Because, yeah. yeah, so, I mean, at the end of the day, most of our stack still looks the same. It now has the beacon chain that it's got to get some information from. Um, so with the different governance versus consensus and multi-chain, the multi-layer, oh man, I forget the term, off of, there's now two layers that are working together. Right, so, so, so there's the, the beacon chain and then there's the execution chain. That's the word I was thinking of. Uh, so so, so you, have, you have your beacon client and you have your execution client. The execution chain uses the beacon chain for consensus yep. to make sure that everybody agrees on what's going on. And then the, the beacon client, or sorry, the execution client keeps all of your state data. Yep. Most of the stuff that our customers come to us for is stuff that they get that they want about the the execution client. Okay. Uh, in general, if you're not a validator yourself, you don't care all that much about what's going on in the beacon chain. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are a validator, you've got to be running your own nodes. We can't do that for you. Yep. Right. Um, no, I mean there, there are people. You, you know, there, there's uh, validator pools where you can you know ch chip in some ETH and somebody else will r run the node. But Flat at the mind. end of the day, whoever is running. The, the validator nodes has to run their own nodes. They can't rely on other people to do that for them. Yeah. So, uh, who would you say, if not competition, you know, competitors on the same playing field? So, uh, you know, our, our two biggest competitors are Infura and Alchemy. So, Infura is a consensus property. Mm -hmm. uh, Alchemy is their own thing, but they've gotten uh, a, a lot of investment from a lot of traditional institutions. Um, you know, neither of them open source very much of what they do, yep. um, and in general, they tend to follow the market and uh, whatever chains people are demanding or the chains that they go to. We're kind of trying to turn that on their head and go to 
the chains that need more infrastructure in order to build an audience, mm -hmm. that there's a lot of chains out there that can't get very much traction because they don't have the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, and and th th that's kind of the area that we're trying to serve. And because we're open source, you know, if you can get information out of whatever chains client mm -hmm. into Cardinal, our, our EVM client, or Flume, our indexing client, um, th those are, are g fairly chain agnostic yep. and, and can serve any EVM-based chain. Uh, and, and because they're open source, anybody can take those and run them for, for their own chain. What do you how do you feel about uh, more, there's, there seems to be um, more chains coming out that are non-EVM compatible. So, at this moment. Yeah, sure. Uh, and I feel like there's two different categories of those. Mm -hmm. There's chains like Tezos and Solana mm -hmm. that have gone and done their own thing, but are st well, and, and I guess there's a, a lot of Polkadot based stuff that also fits into that category, although there, there are EVM Moonbeam. there are EVM based chains that also Moonbeam. get, get yeah, Moonbeam from, so um, the, the, those chains that are not EVM compatible um, you know, they, they're trying to compete in their own way for, uh, you know if we could support those easily, we would. Mm -hmm. Right now, our infrastructure, you know, the, the the software that we built is geared towards EVM-based infrastructure. Yeah. And so there's a lot of low-hanging fruit of EVM-based chains that we plan to bring on board. A lot of the primitives that we've built in order, you know, as we were building the, the Cardinal EVM and the, the Flume indexer, uh, a lot of those could be applied to chains that are not EVM-based. But there's a lot more work that we would have to put into supporting those, whereas the EVM-based chains we can, uh, you know, pipeline and bring on board fairly quickly. So you know, that, that that's our focus for the time being. Now, th there's also, uh, particularly in the layer two space, a lot of chains that are you know hyper focused on specific purposes. So you, you've got roll up things that are you, you might might have five operations where you can you know deposit, withdraw, trade. Uh, you know, do, do some very simple things um, that are not as robust as a, an EVM or a Solana or a Tezos, uh, but because of the the limited scope of, of what they do, uh, th they're able to make certain operations way cheaper than they would be on something as robust as an EVM. Okay. What do you? So now that we were talking about non EVM chains, uh, you mentioned Tezos. Uh, I like it for the developer side of things. I think there's, a, there's some really cool opportunities there. Uh, thoughts on Cardano? Uh, pass. Okay. <laughs> thoughts on Hedera? Pass. Thoughts on Solana? Um, I'm going to pass on that one too. Okay. Uh, Polkadot. So, and, and to be clear, part of the reason I passed on some of those others is simply because I haven't had the time to, to get up to speed on them. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, so Solana, I maybe don't want to say some things that might piss a people off. Um, we love you, Solana. But uh, very. Uh, P P Polkadot is a very interesting uh, case. You know, with, with they have kind of built what the Beacon Chain was originally intended, or, or, or the ETH 2.0 was originally intended to be. Mm -hmm. The relay chain uh, and, and the substrate. Is yeah, amazing. Th that. Uh, you know, it's a it's a consensus layer that you can build arbitrary chains on on top of, and uh, you know, e Ethereum is still kind of trying to be that, but they've kind of decided that we're going to let the layer twos uh, use uh, Solidity as their way, or, or EVM opcode as a, their way of committing back yeah. to to Ethereum for the consensus layer. Whereas Polygon has given a much more robust uh, set of tools for establishing, for, for building things uh, that still are ultimately secured by the consensus of the substrate. Funny that you mentioned Polygon. Uh, Sorry, I said Polygon, I meant Polkadot. I, oh. I, I, I mix them up. Polkadot. The time. But uh, no, funny that you mentioned Polygon. I don't. I, th I bet you I know why you said it. Did you see the news? But they both start with PO. Is yeah. It? Uh, but I, 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 my, my head's also been in Polygon because that's the next chain we're going to bring on at Rivet. Nice. So. Uh, Polygon was just used by JP Morgan for their first transaction. Really? Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I mean, you know, JP Morgan, Morgan built Quorum. Um, 
So, I mean, they, they've been tinkering, uh, tinkering in the space for a while, so... Yeah, it's, but, you know, I, I, I guess what are they doing with Polygon? I'm not up to speed it on was, uh, It was one of their large first banking transactions to start building off into adding it into their repertoire and their, their system flow. Like you said, it, uh, TLDR, but um, yeah, that was, the head, that was the headlines of last night and this morning. Okay. So, you know, more to learn there other than people just finding out that they did it or them announcing a press release that they used Polygon, which... I think what might be one of those things that... Like, I mean, lots of people are using Polygon. Disney's using Polygon for some... I'm not up to speed on what, but... Uh, I mean, Polygon is a very high-throughput chain yeah. and, and ma makes it cheap to operate on, and there's a lot of people who are starting to build on it. Thoughts on Boba? I'm not familiar, but... Okay, another layer two there. Um, let's see here, what oh, else? Oh, Boba. Th Boba. Th th that uses uh, similar... Uh, Rollup mechanism to operate. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so with recent chains coming out and stuff like that, um, Optimism, since you brought up Optimism, Arbitrum. Um, so, so, you know, I, I'm fast, I'm, I'm not as familiar as I would like to be with Arbitrum. Uh, I'm fascinated with anything that's, uh, you know, rolling up to the e Ethereum chain as their, their mechanism for, uh, uh, Securing their, their system and you know Arbitrum and Optimism and Boba and you know the the way that they uh, are able to achieve higher throughput and yet still maintain the base level security of the Ethereum blockchain is pretty cool. So one of the things you had said earlier um, was you know with the merge from proof of work to proof of stake, you know nodes being on. How do you feel? that changes the game for decentralization? Um, I, I think the jury's still out on that one. I mean, uh, you know, I, I look at news like the fact that 51% uh, of blocks are OFAC compliant yeah. uh, in the proof of stake world. Now there's, there's a number of reasons for that and I'm not that concerned that those 51% of validators would turn around and try and uh, you exclude block producers that are not OFAC compliant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, 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 I think I think the, I think these are people who uh, are, are perhaps a little bit overzealous with compliance and are, are doing what they think they need to do and maybe giving up a little bit of uh, uh, potential profit in order to stay on the, the compliance side. Um, you know, a, a lot of the concern around. Uh, is proof of stake going to be as decentralized as proof of work? Uh, in some ways, I think it might be more so. Okay. Uh, because in the proof of work world, you had a lot of big mining pools that controlled uh, how a lot of blocks got mined. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, They were totally reliant on the hashing power provided to them by a bunch of decentralized people, and if they started to abuse that, then those people are going to pull back their, their hashing power and take away that, that capability. Yeah. But um, that's not to say they couldn't have done, you know, a, a couple of uh, mining pools couldn't have collaborated to do something nasty uh, in the short term before people realized they needed to pull their, their hashing power away. Uh, validators, from what I've seen, tend to be more widely distributed than, in, in terms of who is creating and proposing blocks, tend to be more widely distributed than the people who were creating and proposing blocks under proof of work. But uh, th there's definitely a higher barrier to entry in terms of the average Joe being able to come in and, and get involved in the process because you've got to have 32 ETH, which is I haven't checked prices in a couple of days. Let's say 13. 13? So, so 13, you know, it, it's, no, it's 15, over, it, it's over $40,000. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so that, that's a high bar for somebody who wants to come in as opposed to, you know, a lot of people could at least have gotten started Got with, the, with the computer that they already had, yeah. you know, pointing their, their GPU at the network when they weren't using it and making a little bit through, you know, a mining pool. Yeah. So, but, but again, if you're doing it through a mining pool, ultimately the people who were creating and proposing the blocks were one of a small set of people 
that happen to have hashing power pointed at them. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I'm certainly not totally sold on proof of stake as as the great decentralizer. Yeah. Um, but I also think there's a lot of people who uh, k kind of oversell proof of work, and that the proof of stake can actually solve a lot of the problems that proof of work solves. So then on that, I'm going to play devil's advocate here because sure. I've had this piece. So proof of stake really, you know, if someone had bad intentions, they knew what it cost, you know? Do you feel that, that enough damage could be done if someone went in to put in enough proof of stake and they didn't care getting slashed down the road um, losing all of it? Do you, think, do you I, feel that someone could do that? I'm not sure it would be any cheaper to do with proof of stake than it would have been to do with proof of work. Okay. Um, because at, at the end of the day, what you needed under proof of work was mining hardware and electricity. What you need under proof of stake, and, and you know, one of the things to keep in mind with the way Ethereum has implemented proof of stake is uh, onboarding as a validator uh, is a, a process that goes through a queue. So, so you can't just uh, you know, spend a billion dollars on ETH and a and, and billion dollars wouldn't even get you anywhere near the the, no. valid, the the validator power that you would need to. But but uh, you know it, it, even if you spent a billion dollars on ETH and tried to bring all of that on on validators, it would take you weeks, if not months, to, to bring those validators online because of the way the the uh, only a certain number of new validators can come on with each epoch. Yeah. Uh, so you know, it, it, it would certainly have to be a long game for somebody to to, to try and attack attack the network anyway, um, and, and then practically speaking, they're out their investment. Um, so you could have done that before by buying a bunch of of mining equipment, and, and you know, realistically, these are going to have to be state actors to to yeah. de deploy those sorts of resources. Uh, could they have come up with that kind of hashing power and that kind of electricity? I think so. Yep. Um, so, um, it, it would be hard to do it without being noticed, but I think it could be done. Okay. So right now, um, as we're talking about you know application usage, do you feel that there's that you're a service that the average user, the daily user, just the DGen, the guy just getting into or that knows crypto and NFTs and wants to do something a little bit more or are you more towards the company chains? Um, so, so you know the, our primary audience are people who are building applications mm -hmm. right so you know if you are just the average user mm -hmm. you can come to Rivet set up an account get your URL off the dashboard, add that to MetaMask and use us instead of Infura, which is the default for MetaMask, or you know, whatever wallet application you want to use. Um, if you're using uh, Encrypt by uh, my Ether wallet, you are using us instead of uh, Infura. But I love Mew and love the Mew team. They're, they're awesome. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, you know, so, so it is possible for the average user to make use of us and, and most you know, typical users, uh, if they did that, they could get by totally on our free tier without having to, to pay us a dime. Uh, what know, would be the benefit for them doing that, do you feel, uh, at, at, a, at a normal user level? So d depending on where you are, uh, performance, okay. uh, you know, we, we have faster servers than Infura, but generally speaking, when you're looking at latency, you know, the, the, the perfor query performance, the key decider of whether you're going to get fast response or slow response is how far away you are physically from the data center that's serving you, and so and cell phone reception. Yeah, so so I mean that, that that's just really going to depend on, yeah. um, you know where you happen to be on the planet relative so to our data a, centers or their data a nerd centers. move, uh, in a way. But but no, the the, the the other thing I would say is. Uh, our privacy policy is rock solid for our users. Yeah. The, the, in our privacy policy, we make guarantees that protect our users from us. We are not selling your data. Yeah. Uh, if, if we were selling your data and you could prove it, you could sue us for all sorts of money because we said you could in our privacy policy. 
all of our competitors have privacy policies that protect the, the the service provider that if they were caught selling your policy there's not much you can or not if they were caught selling your data there's not much you can do about it I think, the mo policy. I think most of them just say they they sell them your data or they give the third parties have uh, access to your data uh, yeah, they don't necessarily say that they're doing it but they they certainly protect themselves in the event that uh, it comes that out they, that, that they were here so, so so if, if you come and you put rivet into your metamask instead of having infura as, as which is the default as your mm -hmm. uh, then you, you're gonna have a, a little bit of a privacy assurance now that, that that's to the extent that you trust legal contracts, uh, which you know, part of the point in this space is that you shouldn't have to trust those things. If you really don't want to trust anybody, run your own node. Yeah. Um, that would be fun. Ooh, did you hear about the new phone? I forget who it's called. Forty-one thousand dollars. It's its own node. Really? Yeah. That seems expensive for a nerd. I think that one um, also is like gold encrusted and stuff like okay. that. Okay. Yeah, but a full, all layer wallets, um, and, and it's its own node. Huh. Yeah. Uh, pretty hilarious. Uh, I just read about that on my drive from Las Vegas to Tucson. I had my mm -hmm. phone read that to me. Okay, I was going to say you were reading while you were driving. No, I put on the accessibility features. Gotcha. So articles get read to me. That's cool. I, I usually just mm -hmm. look for podcasts that are, are you know, going to talk to me anyway. Man, I want to talk back when I when I hear those. I'm like, but hold on. <laughs> I, I know that feeling. Yeah. So no, and that's why you know hosting a daily show on on Twitter, uploading stuff to YouTube. Uh, I I have found that I get to ask the questions again. You know. So what's one of the coolest nerdest things you're doing right now? Right now. You. Me. Um, you, you know, it, 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 I, I guess most of the cool nerd stuff that I've done th this year I did in the early part of the year as I was getting Cardinal ready to go out the door. Uh, at this point, it's all about expanding the new chains, indexing data, um, which to me isn't necessarily the exciting part, but it's, it's what we were leading up to as we were building the cool new stuff. Okay. Can we talk business side on that too? So if someone's listening to this and they're like, what do they do? How do they reach out to you? Uh, so, yeah, we're, we're, we're Rivet. Uh, our website is rivet.cloud. Uh, my email address is austin.roberts at rivet.cloud. Okay. Um, we'll have that in the comments. No, please don't. I don't okay. want it indexed. Like, I, mean, <laughs> I, I guess there's going to be a transcript of this whole thing. People are going to find it anyway. But, um, you know, go, go to rivet.cloud. That, rivet that, that you can put in the, the, we'll put that the, in the comments. Yeah. And, you, you know, from there you can can sign up for our service or find ways to contact us. Okay, yeah, definitely. So, um, do you guys prefer like gaming chains, carbon? What do you? How do you guys feel on um, helping the environment? Um, I, I mean, we're certainly not opposed to helping the environment. I mean, a lot of what we've done is, is about lowering the the, the cost and, and costs when you're talking about computers very often translates to you know energy consumption carbon emissions um, you know we're about reducing the, the computational requirements for serving applications the, the data that they need um, less data less energy less energy less usage less damage for sure um, now um, I, I, I will say I think a lot of the uh, environmental challenges to, to things like proof of stake have largely uh, been a little bit misdirections. Mm -hmm. That there's people who have their own reasons for opposing what blockchain technology does mm -hmm. and they look to uh, the, the climate fight as a way that they can uh, control the narrative. Yeah, to tr try and control the narrative. And, and you know, that, that's not to say that the energy consumption that goes into proof of work is a good thing necessarily, but um, you, you know I, I, I think the the downsides to it are fairly overstated when you compare it to uh, you know the industries that we're trying to replace, for example. That that you know if, if you look at you know, the traditional monetary system, yeah, you, you have dollars and coins. Coins get smelted, yeah. Right. Well, it costs more to mint a to create a dime or a nickel 
it's like two cents over the actual value. Of it. That doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. Um, I, I've certainly known that's the case for, with pennies for ages, but it's yeah. probably true with more and more of our coinage yeah. as inflation you get, goes. You get more from the copper value of a penny than actual a penny. Uh, yeah. Um, but, but you know, the, the, the energy that goes into the making, of the, the, the making of coins, and then when you look at, you know, the, the dollars going to banks and, yeah. and businesses, you know, in armored trucks and, and all of the energy that gets expended moving those things around, if if we were able to successfully transition to a cryptocurrency based economy even if that cryptocurrency based economy was ultimately secured by proof, proof of work i think not having yeah. the, the level of infrastructure that goes into just moving yeah. you know pa papers and coins around uh, is ultimately going to be worthwhile plus there's the the, the whole aspect of, of disintermediation that you know, when you've got a bank that's uh, r responsible for holding this money for you, if they decide they're not going to hold uh, hold the money for this kind of business, that kind of business doesn't have a whole lot to do. There's nobody who can do that for uh, cryptocurrency. So you know, you, like you, you've, I, I know things have changed in this respect, but in the early days of legal weed, mm -hmm. dispensaries couldn't find banks. They, oh, yeah. they couldn't find anybody. Bags who, of cash. Right. Yeah, and they couldn't even find armored truck companies, so they, right. they hired private people like, hey. Right. So, uh, it, you know, I, I think things like that are a real... It, well, and, and you see it, you know, in the porn industry with, uh, you know, Pornhub, I think for I think this is over, but for a while they were cut off by Visa and MasterCard. Yep. Uh, you know, Patreon, too. Only fans for, you know, yeah. they a year ago they were talking about... Uh, not allowing adult content on their platform in large part due to pressure from th their payment processors and um, I don't think payment processors ought to have that kind of power over legal entities and and, and part of the pro and, and, and that's not to say that that you know a business that is a payment processor ought to be forced to do business with somebody they don't want to do business with but they do kind of have a monopoly that that no one else has nobody actually. else can get into um, and, and I also think there's an element of politicians putting pressure on the financial companies because they're they're like this yeah and uh, th those in turn you know a, a politician who couldn't uh, make a law to make this illegal can still effectively put a stop to it by butting up to you, you know their friends at the the financial institutions yeah. and say, you know, let's make it hard for these guys to, to move money around. So, you know, I, I think from those respects, uh, what cryptocurrencies is doing, whether it's proof of stake or proof of work. Or even uh, proof of history. Or, or proof of whatever. Yeah. Uh, if, I, I think that's a very valuable thing and, and that disintermediation uh, can't be discounted just because of environmental downsides. That yeah. And, and I, I want to roll back two things. One, I know I said copper versus... So it's the price of the metals within it that are outvalued, which doesn't make any sense. Yep. The, the total price of the value of the metal. Is yeah, pennies are mostly zinc these days. Yes, but, yeah. yeah but, no, but, but so I wanted to roll that back. Yeah. Because um, as soon as I said it, I was like, I just said something I knew was wrong. <laughs> and, um, but um, talking... like Even with... like It's very easy. The computational power of the hash... Electricity is a basic math that, you know, it's all very easy to dollars and cents that out. Mm -hmm. But what a lot of people seem to like underrepresent is what miners are doing because they know the cost of their electricity. So they are working mm -hmm. to make it as profitable as, as possible. So a lot, I know a lot of miners that use uh, renewable energy sources. Well, and, and they don't take that into account. And, and, and another thing that, that doesn't often does not get account, accounted for when they're talking about how much energy goes into to mining. Uh, when you have things like nuclear power plants and you have things like coal-fired, coal hydro hydroelectric, coal, well, actually hydroelectric uh, can, can turn it on and off very quickly. Yeah. But when you have things like nuclear power plants or coal-fired power, power plants, 
they can't just on a dime stop producing electricity because demand went down. Yep. So they've got to do something with that electricity or their, their lines are going to overheat. Yep. So what do they do with it? Well, in a lot of places, and actually, from what I understand, in a lot of places, the street light systems mm -hmm. that, that they have, those were put in not to light the streets, but as something that they could run off electricity into. Okay. Uh, that, that, uh, n n but a lot of miners mm -hmm. have gone to power companies and said, when you have excess electricity that you need something to dump it into, mm -hmm. send it over to our mining rigs. We, we will turn on our mining rigs when you have excess capacity and are going to sell that to us very cheap. Mm -hmm. And then when once you've had time to spin your power production down a bit to, to meet the real demand, we'll, we'll turn off those mining rigs. And, and, and so they're essentially kind of smoothing out some of the curves for electric sources that, that can't fluctuate immediately based on demand. Yeah. Um, and, and so you, that that's electricity that if it weren't going into mining rigs is going to end up going on, going out to turn on lights somewhere. Yeah. Just because the, the lights are needed to run off the power so yeah. the lines don't get too hot. That's actually interesting. I did not know that. I knew that there was a few mining companies that had partnered with electric, electrical companies for like off-grid power mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, but I didn't know that about the street lights. Yeah. Cool. Well, and, and I, I don't know, you know, most street lights anymore are LED based street lights, which makes them way Even less more, energy uh, requirements yeah. than they were back in the incandescent days. But my understanding is that in a lot of the places that first started rolling out electric street lights, which is you know, well before my time, mm -hmm. but that was part of what they were doing with it was this is a way that when the, the the consumer demand goes down and the power company can't lower the the production quick enough they can route that into street lights even if it's the middle of day yeah uh, th that gives them some place to send the electricity all right cool I like that um, now can we go into opinions sure opinion on crypto what's your favorite crypto right now um oh I mean I'm a long time Ethereum enthusiast. Uh, okay. Enthusiast. Um, you know, I, I still think. Um, I'm getting messages on my watch. Yeah. I'm not concerned about the time. Um, the, the, uh, the, the Ethereum ecosystem brings a lot to the table uh, that. You know, it, it, it's got a very robust ecosystem, a lot of interoperability across different projects, um, th things that are hard to find in other projects, and a lot of other projects are still trying to play catch up on that. Um, you know, th th that that for and and you know, f full disclosure, I, I bought into Ethereum during the Ethereum presale in 2014. Okay. Um, now, unfortunately, I you had to wait. Two what? More years. You had to wait two more years. Well, I, no, I was going to say, unfortunately, while, while I bought ETH at thirty cents, I sold most of it at seven dollars. Yeah. So, uh, you, you know, I'm not uh, I, I'm, rolling in dough here. I, um, I know, but I know, uh, that feeling. <laughs> I know but, that but no, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a project that I've always been very bullish on. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, and, and you know, I think there's lots of other great projects out there. Um, it, you know, I, I'm also a big fan of Ethereum Classic. Okay. Um, I still had a lot of my Ethereum Classic that I sold it off when it hit like 140. Yeah, I, I, I did that as well. But then I, I also bought back into that, that yeah. ecosystem. I bought back when it was like hit like 15. Um, and like, yeah. I, you got to post fork. Uh, yeah, Ethereum Classic in it. Yep. So, uh, thoughts on uh, NFTs? So, you know, I think NFTs are still finding their purpose. Okay. Um, There's a ton of different use cases for NFTs being presented here at the LA Blockchain Summit um, for different things. So I, I've always had this vision for you know, a, a future, and, and, and this is so, so, yeah, not, not too far off, but I, you know, I, th I think it's something that we will see someday where you want to uh, get in your car. Mm -hmm. and go somewhere. So you walk up to your car, you swipe your phone. Okay. And your phone, you know, fr from the end user's perspective, you just swipe your phone 
car door opens, you get in, the engine starts, mm -hmm. right? That's all you did. You swipe your phone and turned on. But behind the scenes, your phone was getting the ID from the car, goes out to the internet, uh, goes out to the blockchain, checks, make sure that you're up to date on payments for, for the car. That, you know, if you got a loan for that car, it's not going to start if you haven't made your payments. Okay. And that may sound horrible, but we'll bring this back around in a minute. Okay. Uh, and that, you know, it also makes sure that you're insured so that you're not going to drive around and hit other people and, and not yeah. be, be accountable for it. Um, and your, your phone goes out to the blockchain, gets cryptographic proofs for that, provides those cryptographic proofs to your car, your car unlocks and starts. Okay. Right? So, so, so from the end user's perspective, it's totally seamless. Uh, now, you also are talking about a future where there's complete coverage everywhere you go. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you, yeah well, uh, you, you at least have to c cover out the possibility that you know somehow you got to be able to start your car if that yeah. doesn't hold. Yeah. But uh, it, you know, and maybe it's not every time. You know, there's lots of details to figure out. But uh, you know, so, so in, in in that case, your car is represented by an NFT on the blockchain. Yeah. And so long as you have made your payment on the loan that corresponds to that NFT, there's nobody in the world who can stop you from starting your car, yeah. right? Um, and the, the the way I would see that, you know, backing up a little further in that story, when you went into the car dealership to buy your car, mm -hmm. the, the car dealership went to a, a decentralized marketplace to crowdfund the purchase of your vehicle. Okay. And, and part of the deal in that was that your car is only going to start so long as you've made your, your payments out to on the, the contract. And the contract for that, in my mind, is an NFT. And, and so, you know, it, it's not the NFT. It, it's a non-fungible token in the sense that there, there is an NFT that represents the mortgage. There is an yeah. NFT that represents your car. There is an NFT that represents your insurance payment. Yeah. Or your, your insurance contract. Um, th that none of those look like apes. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but I think there's a, a future where a great deal of, of how we interact with the world will be represented by NFTs. Okay. And, and, then, and what's really cool with NFTs, so many things can be nested within them too. Right. Games, time, time usage, code, um, programs, access, so much more. Yeah. You know, like... Um, there's there's a company that does 3D model printed homes. Okay. The printing file is stored in an NFT that if their uh, reader is connected to two different types of uh, home printers, that home does not need to recount, like those printers don't need to recalibrate. They know exactly how to print that home based on their system. Neat. Yeah. Um, it's phenomenal. So, um, all right. Uh, I see that you're thinking very future use case and that there is a future on that. That's pretty amazing. Awesome. I like that car idea for the crowdfunding piece, which then I think of like over collateralized loans that self repay, which then pays for the car itself over time. There's another scenario there that so I haven't all even in a talked about. Contract. Is, you know, instead of having your car that you get into, you know, you, you get out your phone, and, and, and you know, as we get to having more and more self-driving cars, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, you call, call a car to come to you on your phone, you pay a decentralized Uber. That, that car, yeah. who owns that car? Who funded th that car? Yeah. Maybe it, maybe it's just a, a decentralized contract of you, you know, you got a bunch of people to chip in. Buy this car. Yeah, yeah. This car has ten thousand owners. It's driving around, picking up uh, uh, people making profit. Picking up people making profit, spending. paying it back to the the people who paid for the car in the first place. I like that thought. I'm going to take a note on that. And, and sure, you know, it, it's got to pay back. Yeah. It, it's got to pay for its insurance contract. Yeah, it, it's got to pay for somebody to come clean it, mm -hmm. uh, or, or not come clean it, but you know, it's it's going to go to them. And Car so, so that yeah. after some guy has just puked in the back because he was drunk on the way home, uh, don't drink and drive. Well, no, it's the car's He's driving. driving. The car's right. driving. Yeah, no, he was uh, in the back. So yeah, no use. Right. So, I think Vegas has some of that platforms where they're self-driving cars, but they have a, a an observer sitting in there. Right. So um, I, I, I saw something recently that there was a 
It, it might have been in San Francisco or something, but there's a self-driving car service that you, you can summon a self-driving car to come get you just like you would with Uber or Lyft. And it'll it, now they, they've done, you know, low tens of thousands of miles of, of driving mm -hmm. so far, uh, at least with, with live passengers. Yeah. Um, but no, nobody's in the car except the passenger. Um, nice. So we're, we're getting there. Yeah. Um, and, and even NFTs could be maps, you know, and routes. Yeah. So this is one thing then, since you're providing infrastructure on data, um, more and more is what I would like to call space junk in a way. Data, I no longer use data. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that that will create a backlog at some point? Uh, it can't be purged, you know. Um, it can, though. Okay. So, okay, so... Should it be, then? Hear me out. Okay. Um, Ethereum operates off of the concept of a state tree. Mm -hmm. so, so there's this cryptographic structure where you can prove the existence of any piece of, of data with respect to the state tree. Yes. And, and right now, anybody who runs an Ethereum node has to have that entire state tree. Yeah. Um, now, it, for for Cardinal, the the service provide that Rivet uses under the hood to serve data, we flattened out that state tree, yeah. uh, and the, can't make a lot of the proofs that that traditional nodes can can make. But it would be entirely possible for my node to forget a branch. Uh, yeah, to, to forget about this contract over here, mm -hmm. and then if I needed to validate a transaction that pertained to that contract. Mm -hmm. I would have to get proofs about the data in that contract. I, I, I may keep it after that. I may not. Okay. Right. But but uh, one of the things that they're talking about doing in the purge, in the the you know, we were talking earlier, yeah. all, all the different urges: the merge, the purge, the verge, the sur splurge, the surge, the whatever. Um, Four of them. Over the next four well, years. Well, the, the merge yeah. was the first the one. And merge four first. more. Um, okay. But uh, the, the the purge part of that is uh, well, so, so the verge part of that is is tra transitioning from a hexary uh, Merkle tree to a binary Verkle tree. Mm -hmm. I don't understand what a Verkle tree is different from a Merkle tree. I but but at the end of the day, part of the goal there is that somebody who wants to execute a transaction yep. can provide a cryptographic proof of the data that there that pertains to their transaction. So that even if the miners or uh, validators who are composing a block based on that transaction haven't kept that data around, um, they, they can still validate that transaction because the transaction proposer is able to provide them with all of the data that they need. Yeah. So there becomes a future here where these, the, the, the miners, all of the nodes that are operating, can go ahead and forget about contracts that nobody's used in a long time. But if somebody cares about that contract, they can configure their node to remember it. And so that then if they submit a transaction, it then turns on the memory of everything. It, 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 it provides yeah. the it, it pulls the proof out of their node to send it with their transaction so that it can be validated. So, so, so they, almost they, like triggering a memory in a way. Right, they, they, and and then that proof that they've got that can still be validated against the Merkle root that or Verkle root mm -hmm. going forward uh, of the rest of the chain. So. Um, you know, in that way, the people who need this data to persist mm -hmm. can be responsible for persisting it. Yeah. And everybody else doesn't have to remember it and keep it around. But if it gets lost, it's gone. There's an aspect of that, that Merkle tree, or Verkle, Verkle tree, that can no longer be proven because nobody still has the data for it. But that's okay. It, it, it's not costing anything to have it there in the Verkle tree that people can't prove it. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, yeah. So it's not necessarily gone. 
It's right. Just, it's just it, forgotten for now. Right. Yeah. And, and, and the people who need a particular like a collection a wing of, of wing data, of, wing of a house boarded up in a way, like so they can save on heat. Right. Yeah. So that way, it's not actually. It's gone. like putting it on microfiche. Okay. Uh, you know. You, oh, dude, I, we were talking about this the other day. Burn uh, the papers. Of, put it on microfiche. Uh, dude, um, and he's, I, I, I call it microfiche. <laughs> I love how words. I, I say so many words wrong. Um, it means you learn them from reading overwhelmingly. Yes. Because if you learn them from conversations, you say them the way the people you were conversing with. Yeah. Uh, say I, them, but but if you learn it from reading, you, you just make a best guess and go with it. Yeah. You should, yeah. I heard someone say eth the other day. Do you own any eth? Welcome to eth global. And I was like, no. <sighs> yeah. But but and, and for for a long time, you know, I work in the, the Ethereum node space. For a long time, I said geeth for geeth nodes because it didn't make any sense to me that it should be geth when, when it's just tapping in. G on the front of ETH. Yeah. Um, but but at the same time, my business partner's named Beth. It's not ETH. <laughs> no, have you called her that? Uh, maybe. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I've made the same comment of, you know, it's Beth, not ETH. But, okay. Um, All right. Can we get into some hot topics? Why not? Okay, cool. Um, so one of the big things with Web3 is uh, wagging. All right. We're all gonna make it, right? All right. So now then there was that there was a fun, there was a a nag me none of us are gonna make it or you're not gonna make it. Um, but one of the things that I've I'm old, so I come from the days of plur, peace, love, unity, respect. Okay. I might have been a raver kid, happy, hardcore, something like that. We're not gonna talk about those days, but um, that was sort of like the the process back then that everyone sort of thought like, hey, you want to be part of this? You're part of this, uh, as you say you are. So one of the things that wagged me sort of is that we're all going to make it, but what we've seen as um, Web3 has started to really move forward is that a lot of Web2 um, practices were moved forward into Web3 or have st started to sneak into Web3, usually around vo disenfranchised voices, whether women, minority, um, different countries, all of that. Um, but one of the cool things that I've sort of seen is the new take on it of, like, it's such a blank slate that it is very obvious when something should is talked about or talked to or just so sort of like turning to someone else rather than, you know, you know, adding everyone to the conversation. Um, do you think that that's how how how's that changing in your in your views? So, honestly, I don't see a whole lot of that. I, I tend to be fairly heads down on the technology side. Okay. Um, that you know, th this is the first conference I've been to in was Denver uh, nine months. Yeah. Um, and before that, it had been a couple of years. Yeah. Um. You know, I've got a business partner who pays a lot closer attention to what's going on at the community level. I'm mostly paying attention to what goes on at the technology level. I don't, I, in the tech sector, do you see more people of color and, and more women coming into it? Um, more, more than what? More than, more than we used to have? Yeah, more than, or at least uh, yeah, more than we used more, to have. More in this industry than, than other industries. Um, I don't know, it, you know, it's, there are a lot of legacy barriers that, that you know, are, are going to take a, a generation to overcome, okay. right? That, that uh, you know, I am as good at the technology as I am because I grew up in the late 80s, early 90s in a house that had a computer. Yeah. There are not that many people, particularly minorities, uh, and you know, it, it, to, to the extent that women grew up in a house in the early '90s, you know, they weren't necessarily encouraged to go play with this computer in the yeah. same way that I was. So, you know, that sucks, and you know, the, but that's not something we're going to overcome quickly, right? That that the people 
you know, the, the, the white boys that, that were playing with computers in the 80s and 90s uh, learned a ton that the kids who didn't have that kind of opportunity didn't learn at, at fundamental ages in their life, and that's not their fault. Yeah. But you also can't, uh, it, you know, o overcome that now. And, and so, you know, I do see the numbers increasing. Yeah. But I, I don't see it balancing out yet, and, yeah. and I don't think it will for a while. Right. Um, you know, I, I want to see it happen. Yeah. Um, but there's, there's, it, it's going to take time. Right. Is Rivet doing anything to help on that? Um. Well, I don't want. I don't want to talk into the, like the line, and I really hate this word, but like it's. I don't. I haven't heard of another way of terming it. Not affirmative action, but actual like going out and involvement. Well, you know, I I, I will say this: we we hire the best people we can find wherever we can find them. Okay. So, one of my business partners, I'm just Beth. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're, we're a woman co-founded company. Okay. Um, cool. We, we our, our you know, you go to rivet.cloud mm -hmm. and see that website. Mm -hmm. It was designed by a Nigerian kid. I mean, I say kid. He's nineteen, twenty. He's in, in college. Um, nineteen. But uh, you know, we we found great talent in happened to be in Nigeria, uh -huh. excited to work with us. Okay. We you know th that's where we found our talent. That, that's what we're working with. You know, we, we've got DevOps people in India. You know, we we find the the, ta the the best talent we can where we find it, um, and. You know, there's there's a lot of data that shows people with more diverse team, companies with more diverse teams, have a lot more success. And I yeah. don't think you get that by targeting diversity yeah. as your primary goal. I think you get that by looking for the best talent you can find wherever that talent happens to be, yeah. and not deciding that that person doesn't look like the person I expect to feel fill this role. So I'm going to pass on them. Um, so, um, no, no, yeah, I, I mean, we, we, we've got a, we have a legacy, we've got a more diverse team than you would have with a, a traditional seven person startup. Yeah. Um, no, and that's, that's awesome. Um, it's one of those things to where we always like to try to see, um, I like to see it because I've seen it more and more like, cause I am on, you know, last time we saw each other was in Denver, right. most likely, but like traveling around, I would literally be sitting um, like with a woman of, of fintech that like industry, like 30 years of fintech and like legacy finance mm -hmm. and she's been in blockchain like before even me and then like I would have someone else talking and they would like ask me an industry question and I'm like, I'm a DJ, ask her. Right. And then they would look at her, they'd start talking and then they would like turn to me and I'm like, Oh yeah, you know, and, and we yeah. we definitely see some of that in conversations. Uh, you know, when you, when we've got the three founders together, like I'm going to answer the technology questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Greg, well, you know, marketing related things and, mm -hmm. and legal related things, but you know, anything about you know, how do you manage a team, how do you get these things done on time, th those are questions for Beth, right? Uh, but but you know, we, we have certainly encountered times where. Um, you know, p people are looking to me with these questions. And I'm like, you know, go, go talk to her. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm not the one to answer that. Yeah. Um, so for regular devs and stuff like that, are you guys hiring right now in any way, shape, or form? Um, not at the moment. Okay. We are wrapping up a raise and okay. hope to be hiring fairly soon. How much are you guys trying to raise? Uh, we are trying to raise five and a half million. Okay. And what is the purpose of that five and a half million? Uh, so it's really about branching out and growing, uh, uh, growing into more chains and being able to, to bring on more chains quickly. Okay, so are you doing large ticket investors, small ticket investors? Lar lar largely, at, at this point it's more large ticket investors. Okay. Um, we've worked with, uh, you know, th this, let's see, do we have, who are we looking for? Oh, uh, we can see, uh, DGH's name is way down here. Draper Gordon Holm, the, the people running Hosting. this LA Blockchain Summit. Yeah. Uh, were our first investors. Yeah. Uh, and and they, they have been phenomenal at making connections for us. And then we also work with Digital Financial Group okay. um, and, and some investors that they've brought to us. Uh, but at this point, um, 
but and you know, community so, 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 level involvement available? N- n- not at the not at the raise level at this point. Um, we're looking at options for uh, giving community the opportunity to invest in some of our specific projects. Mm-hmm. Um, but but, it, but at this point we're you know if we've got qualified investors who are looking maybe but uh, at this point we're not open to community. All right. Uh, any 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 bug bounties or anything like that? Um, we have in the past. We don't have anything open right now. All right. Are you guys doing any current grant programs or um, hackathons? Um, that's a great question. He. he he organizes those sorts of things. Uh, I don't think we've got any grant programs going on at the moment. Uh, mm-hmm. We may be involved with some hackathons that I don't know about. Okay, cool. No. Um, so, yeah, no. Um, I think we pretty much covered everything. Um, but we do have to end this on the two best things ever. Two best things ever? Oh, yeah. Jokes. Jokes. Do you have any dad jokes? Oh, man. I have tons, but now that you're putting, putting me on the spot, they're, they're not coming to me. Um, can I, I'll open with one joke that is the worst joke on the face of the planet, but it will make you be like, <laughs> are you ready for it? Go for it. Yes, okay, I got permission. So, be prepared to be disappointed. <laughs> Every Wednesday night, Superman hangs out with his blockchain buddies, you know, and it does talks everything about coins, Tokens, NFTs, degen things, infrastructure, just all the degen stuff. Any techie, geek thing they can. Um, and so that's every Wednesday night. One Wednesday morning, Lo, uh, you know, Lois Lane goes to Clark Kent and she's like, Honey, I need you to do the dishes tonight. And he's like, I can't, honey. I'm powerless. And she's like, Why? It's my crypto night. It did what you said it would do. Disappoint? I make you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any that, other that, jokes? That's my version of that. <laughs> um, sorry? Any other jokes from you? Um, now you know what level we're at. Well, you you want to hear my favorite comment, don't you? I totally do. Okay, you start. All right. Knock, knock. Who's there? Banana. Banana who? Knock, knock. Who's there? Banana. Banana who? Knock, knock. Who's there? Banana. Banana who? Knock knock. Who's there? Orange. Orange. Who? Aren't you glad I didn't say banana again? All right. Yes. It's been fun. It has been. Want to hear my best knock knock joke? Sure. Knock knock. Who's there?